prepare our heart for worship, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Glory be to God in heaven, peace to those who love him well. and worship you. We adore you and praise you with all of our hearts, you who are God, the sovereign creator and redeemer of your people. You are the eternal, almighty, holy and righteous king of all the earth, ruling and ordering all things according to your wisdom, plan and purposes. We bow before you, remembering your word. My thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We come because in your goodness and mercy and love you have revealed yourself to us. You have made us your adopted children and graciously invited us to this your own table through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, Father... We praise you, we acknowledge that you and you alone are the one true God. Enable us now to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. For we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine? Oh, 
Well, we turn to God's Word, we turn to our Bibles, Isaiah 53, it's found on page 714. Isaiah 53, please follow the reading. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall go up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He is no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers it is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Wonderful how the Bible really proves itself. And of course, all those Prophecies came true when Jesus came to this earth. To God be all the praise and the glory. Amen. We come before God in our prayer of confession and supplication. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, as we contemplate your goodness and holiness, we are aware of our sin. And Father, we are also aware of our unrighteousness. We've broken your just laws. We've forgotten our vows of obedience to you. We have sinned grievously against you in thought, word, and deed. We have provoked your indignation and anger by our indifference to you and our rebellion against you. We come, therefore, not to claim that we are upright and worthy, but on the contrary, as sinners who seek our justification and perfection through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and his blessed work of salvation. O God, look on us in mercy according to your gracious promise. Pardon all our sins, for we plead the merits of your Son, our Saviour, sealed to us by his atoning blood. Speak to each one of us your own words of forgiveness and peace as we humbly bow before you our, in your holy presence, brought face to face with you, our God and Father, by your Son who has opened up for us a new and living way into your presence. 
We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our only Saviour and Mediator, who taught us as a family to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We turn to our Gospel reading, Luke 22, and we're going to read our Gospel reading responsibly. Our theme tonight, of course, being the Lord's Supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? Jesus said to them, Behold, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. And Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. And again, we see God's blessing upon that reading from his word. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Oh, no. 
We turn to our epistle reading, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 33. Here we have the institution of the Lord's Supper as recorded by Paul. Again, we'll read it responsibly. For I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Also, he took the cup of the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And again, we seek God's blessing upon that reading from his word. Just a reminder, a few things from the announcement. Um, happy Father's Day to all brothers here tonight. And we do pray God's richest blessing upon you. Um, we not only celebrate fathers, but we also celebrate the gift of manhood that God has given to us. Just a reminder, there will be no midweek Bible study on Wednesday. There will be the um, Women's Fellowship Group and also the online on Tuesday night. Um, I'll be in Sydney flying down tomorrow, um, so that's why there is no Bible study. Um, youth group, that's the younger group this Friday, and then the following Friday, of course, the young adults meet again. Um, Saturday, um, just working bee, the postponed working bee will be this Saturday, commencing at 9am. Distribution of soil and turf. And they will be concentrating on the manse backyard. I think that's all that we have to announce. Oh, um, it's just to let you know that Jessie Bay is home, but she didn't feel up to coming. She is home, wasn't she? Yes. She didn't feel up to coming, which is understandable. Your utterage is still in St Andrews. Just pray that they'll be able to resolve all the issues. Um, Hannah was not able to make it back. I was not aware of that. Um, apparently... Um, some strain, I'm not sure if it's COVID, broke out in the city that she's in and uh, being under Biden, of course, they were immediately had to test to make sure that they weren't positive. That test took a long time to come back, so she hopes to return on the 18th of this month. Akella leaves for South Sudan this Saturday for four weeks, pay for safety for her as she visits her mother and also other family members. Okay. We look at 1 Corinthians 11, the passage which we have just read. Here in this passage, the apostle reminds the Corinthians of the institution of the Lord's Supper of its meaning, of its intention, and of its blessings. He does this by highlighting several things. 
begin with, we must note the transmission of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord. Paul received these instructions concerning the meaning and observance of the sacrament directly from Christ. Even though he was not in the upper room with the eleven disciples, yet he received these very instructions from the Lord. The New Testament indicates that our Lord revealed himself directly to the apostle on more than one occasion. For example, in Acts 18.9 we read, And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision. And it was during such a time that these instructions concerning the Lord's Supper were given to Paul. And as a faithful steward, he then delivered or passed on to the Corinthians and to us today the way that the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated. And so Paul stresses its institution. The sacrament was instituted and first observed on the night before Christ's crucifixion, right after Judas had left the room to set up the arrest of our Lord. Here we see then right at the outset that the Lord's Supper is only for the Lord's people. It is not to be given or taken by any who do not confess Jesus Christ as Lord. The Lord's Supper, like the sacrament of baptism, they don't belong to the world, but to the Lord's people. In a sense, it is wrong to speak of the Lord's Supper as the Last Supper. It is the Passover that was the Last Supper. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper is, in fact, now the First Supper. The sacrament was instituted in the midst of the Passover. The Passover pointed to the death and the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Now that Christ had come, the old was done away with and the new was taken on board. It is for this reason that the Lord Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The bread of the supper was given during the actual Passover meal or supper. But notice what Paul writes. When he had supped, he took the cup. The meaning is this. The lamb and the Passover feast was a reminder. It was a memorial of their deliverance from the slavery in Egypt. Now the bread was to be a reminder of the body of Christ, which was given to set us free from the slavery of sin. After the Passover meal, Jesus took the cup and gave it to the disciples. This was the new covenant, the shedding of blood to save the people of God. The blood of bulls and goats and sheep could not save anyone. They were only a pointer to the blood that would save, the blood of our Lord Lord and Saviour crucified on the cross. The old pointed to the Saviour. It was but a shadow of what was to come. The new covenant, the blood of Christ, is the shadow turned into reality. Though all of God's people are saved through the same way, through Christ, the Old Testament had but the shadow. We have the reality. We have the real thing, the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. What does our Lord mean when he says, this is my body? Well, we could well say that more blood has been spilled over this clause than any other. In fact, it still divides people today. And the very thing that should unite Christians actually drives them apart. The Roman Catholics believe that in communion, you are literally, literally eating the body and drinking the actual blood of Christ. This is called transubstantiation. That is, the priest has the power to, in fact, change the bread and the wine into the actual body and blood of Christ. The Lutherans believe that while the bread and wine or grape juice 
are not actually changed into the body and blood of Jesus, Christ is present in the communion in a special way. He is, as it were, with and under the bread and under the wine in a way that he is not present when the gospel is proclaimed. This is known as consubstantiation. Con, of course, meaning under. But there's absolutely no biblical warrant for these beliefs and teachings. Upon numerous occasions, Jesus said something equivalent to what he said in the upper room. He said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Did he mean literally that the vine was he and that the branches were the disciples? We all know that he did not. It was a figurative way of describing the close relationship that should be between his disciples and the close relationship that should be between Christ and us. Our Lord said, I'm the door. But he did not point to the door and say, that door am I. Why should it be any different when he says, this is my body? How many times have you answered in reply to a question, who is that on the wall, when someone pointed to a photo or a painting? Oh, that's my daughter or my sister or my mother or father and so on. Did you mean that when you said that's my daughter, did you mean that that picture was the body of your daughter, of your sister or your father? Of course not. Neither is the bread in the Lord's Supper the very body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Eating Christ's flesh and drinking Christ's blood are done with the mind and the heart and not with the teeth and the throat. The Lord's Supper is not a sacrificial presentation to God, but it is a visible proclamation of the gospel. If you like, it is the gospel in picture. With the eye, we are reminded of all that Christ has done for us. And as we eat and as we drink, we take unto ourselves Christ by faith, committing ourselves to love him faithfully, to willingly and gladly obey his word and to give of ourselves sacrificially in his service. Next, Paul points out the continuation of the Lord's Supper, that it is to be celebrated until the return of Christ, when Christ himself will officiate at his supper. Nowhere does the Bible teach that the Lord's Supper must be celebrated every week, as some denominations claim. All that Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper is a witness and a reminder to all that what Christ has done. It is a reminder that Jesus will yet return to judge all people. It is a proclamation of what has happened and the promise of what will yet happen. As such, all Christians should come to the Lord's table. Although we stress that it is the Lord's table, and that we invite all who truly confess Jesus as Lord to partake of this supper, the Lord's table speaks of the covenant which God made for his people through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it must never be taken lightly. This covenant should be entered into a visible way by confessing before God and the congregation your love and loyalty and commitment to the Lord and his church, and then placing yourself under the authority and the loving care of God's representatives, the elders. As you see the gospel in visible form, as you are reminded of the tremendous suffering that Christ underwent for you, how he in fact gave his all, how then can we give less than our all to him? We need to consider how you and I are serving the Lord Jesus, how you and I are responding to the challenges all around us. 
to people with deep spiritual needs, people with physical needs, both here and overseas. Let us reflect Christ and his love in all that we do, giving graciously as he has given graciously to us, really hungering and thirsting after righteousness, desiring to grow in grace, loving his word, praying without ceasing, worshipping God as he is commanded with the Lord's people, living a holy life in a pagan world so that our joy may be complete. And so we've looked at the transmission of the Lord's Supper, the institution of the Lord's Supper, its continuation, and now finally <clears throat> the correction needed in coming to the Lord's table. It was obvious that the people were not, this is talking about the church in Corinth, were not coming to the Lord's table worthily. And so God's judgment fell upon them. Although we are all unworthy, even Paul confessed that he was the chief sinners late, he was chief of sinners even late in his life. And no one is worthy to approach God. Yet an unworthy person saved by the grace of Christ, is in fact commanded to come to the Lord's table. The problem was that the Corinthians were consistently coming to the Lord's table unworthily. They were not coming humbly. They were not coming confessing their sins. They were not coming acknowledging that it was only by God's grace that they were there able to come. In their divisiveness and heresies, they were not reflecting the unity of the church. They contradicted the one. Their actions contradicted the one who died to take away their sins. Some of the Corinthians were deliberately failing in their personal life and used the sacrament as a cloak of hypocrisy. As already stressed, none of us, yes, are worthy to come to the Lord's table except through Christ. But it was this deliberate, conscious and ever-present sin that made the Corinthian Christians guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. They believed that they could sin as they wish and still yet come to the Lord's table. Some were only coming to the Lord's table to fill their bellies, a wrong, a, a, a wrong way altogether. And how did God chastise them? For the Corinthians, the failure to discern the Lord's body rightly brought distress to their bodies. We read that it resulted in diseases and death. Spiritual disease out of their unhealthy souls resulted in physical disease. It was no mere figure of speech. It was actual disease and actual death. Our immediate concern, of course, should be whether or not this chastisement would have come upon any in the 21st century, whether Christians today who also take the Lord's Supper unworthily and not confessing their sin before the Lord and making no attempt to truly repent and walk in the way of holiness and righteousness, whether God's judgment will fall upon them. Well, I can find no other answer than to simply say yes. But please let me stress that this judgment does not fall on Christians who have come with minor faults and failures who perhaps do not even realise that they are in fact sinning against God. It was and is a discipline that the Lord administers to sinners who treat the love, the righteousness and mercy of God with utter contempt. And then let us also remember that chastisement is for a good purpose. In verse 32 we read, But when we are judged, we are dis disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. Discipline or chastisement is for correction, not for punishment. God does not punish his people, but he corrects them. Even in the extreme case of premature death, it was to spare them the judgment of the world's condemnation. 
And so with this warning in mind, we are led to the Lord's table in the spirit of humility and self-inspection. Self-examination must always take part before participation. The Christian should test his life by the objective standards of the Word of God. Do you love all the members of your church family? Are you selfish? Christ taught that you should not come to the Lord's table while at odds with anyone. You should first go and seek reconciliation. Do you love the world more than Christ? Are you serving and loving him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength? If you're guilty of any of these, confess them before Almighty God even now who has promised to forgive all who truly repent. And then come and gladly participate in the Lord's Supper, being challenged and spiritually strengthened as you take Christ unto yourself in faith. But let us not just wait for communion for the Lord's Supper for this self-examination. While it certainly is necessary at this time, we should daily examine ourselves and humbly confess our sins before God. We should daily take hold of God's promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. The institution, the continuation and correction of the Lord's Supper. Let us be challenged by what God has taught us this evening. And let us go into the world being refreshed and strengthened through coming to his table, loving him more, desiring to serve him faithfully, and then coming worthily to the Lord's table whenever that opportunity arises. Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank you that you've spoken to us once again. We, we pray that at all times we may worthily come into your presence and especially worthily partake of this supper tonight. We do not come worthy of ourselves, but we come made worthy in and through Christ. So, Lord, we pray that as we do come, we will be blessed, we will be challenged, we will be strengthened, and that we will gladly go out into the world to show forth your love, your grace and your mercy, being used by you for the extension of your kingdom and for encouraging one another to go spiritually. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our communion hymn, How Can It Be? Christ is risen. <laughs> Supper who has not truly confessed their sins 
or who has not forgiven another person, or who does not have a living faith in Christ. Yet we are cordially, we cordially invite those who do confess Christ as Lord and who are sincerely seeking to walk in his way to come and to join us at this table with the full assurance that the Lord Jesus, who came into the world to be the saviour of the elect, will in no way cast out those who truly seek him. We come to this table not because we are worthy, but because Christ has made us worthy. We do not come with any righteousness of our own, but clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We come not because we are strong, but because we are weak. Not because we deserve heaven's rewards, but because in our frailty and sin, we stand in constant need of your mercy and help. As we have read the institution as given to us by Paul, we join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. Father, again we come rejoicing because of your love for us. Jesus Christ descended the glory of heaven to come and live on this sinful world, to show forth your love, to show who you are, your power, your grace, your mercy, and then to suffer and to die on the cross that we who are sinners may be forgiven and have the right of entry into your eternal kingdom. Father, we do, did not deserve this. It is all of your grace. It is all of your mercy. And so we praise and thank you for the great God that you are. We praise and thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation. We thank you for the living hope that we have in Christ that nothing is able to take us away again from you and that we have that wonderful promise that on that day when we come into your presence, we will hear those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. These things we do pray in Jesus' name. According to institution, command, and example of our Lord Jesus Christ, this bread and having given thanks, I break it and give it to you. Jesus said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. According to the institution, command and example of our Lord Jesus Christ, I take this cup and I give it to you. This cup is the New Testament in the blood of Christ, which is shed for the remission of the sins of many. Drink all of it. Jesus said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks that we've been privileged to sit again at your table. We thank you too for those who once sat here and now sit at your table in the home of many mansions. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit Preserve us from the clever schemes of the evil one. Keep us faithful to the vows which we made when we became communicant members of your church. And mercifully grant that when for us the busy fever of this life is forever hushed, our joys here are ended and our work on earth is completed, we may have perfect communion with you in that kingdom where all the redeemed of the Lord are forevermore. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we sing the um, last verses of our communion hymn, you'll be waited upon for your tithe and free will offering. <laughs>
Just rejoice in your goodness to us. All that we have has come from you. Help us, O oh Lord, to be wise stewards. For those things that you've entrusted to us, may we use them wisely and for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom, both here and abroad. Grow us spiritually, Lord. Help us truly to trust more and more in Christ to study, to show ourselves approved unto you, to take hold of your promises. We pray this in Jesus' name. Almighty God, we pray for the church upon this earth, the fellowship of all believers, and especially for the Reformed Church. Grant that your word may be truly preached, the sacraments rightly administered, and discipline uprightly maintained. We remember before you our own church, the Presbyterian Church of Australia. We remember before you this charge, this church here, and all the people. We pray, Father, that your blessing would rest upon us, that we will be obedient and go out in your name, living the gospel, teaching the gospel, sharing the gospel. We pray for our country. We pray for our sovereign king and for all who are in a position of authority in this land. We pray for our parliaments. We pray for all judges and magistrates, for leaders in agriculture, industry, commerce, and education, for our people. Bless us with righteousness, justice, and peace. We pray for all nations and for our brothers and sisters in the Commonwealth. Give to those who are afflicted by any kind of cross, such as war, plague, poverty, persecution, or disaster. Give them patience, faith, and endurance, trusting in you and knowing that in your strength they are able to do all things and that you are able to deliver them, if not here in this world, truly in the world to come. We remember before your throne of grace, our families and our friends. Grant that we may be united in our faith in you, and in our love for one another. We remember before you those who suffer in body, mind, or estate. Restore health according to your will to our sick. Give peace to the wounded mind and bind up the broken in heart. We bring before you, Jessie, we ask your continued healing strength in her life. We bring before you, Chad, that you will bring rapid healing to his body, Father. We pray for Lynn, not able to be with us here tonight, that she would know your grace and your peace and your comfort. We pray for any others that we name in our heart. Lord, truly bless them and undertake for them. We make supplication for those who have never known you, for those who have wandered from your fold, for those who have become captives to error, those who now have been enslaved by cults and false teachings. Turn them, we ask you, from the darkness to light, that they, with all your faithful people, may again worship and serve you, our God and our Saviour. We offer our prayers of intercession, trusting in the all-sufficient merits of your Son, our only Saviour and Mediator, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A mighty fortress is our God.
communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.